Okay, all right, well, um, so my name is uh, Ian Jarrett, and I'm going to talk about my experiences using OpenNMS to monitor BGP services. Um, first of all, can you hear me at the back, okay? Yeah, fine, good. All right, um, I've got a lot of slides and I've got a lot of pictures, so I might talk quickly through some of this stuff, but what I wanted to try and do is um, convey the experiences that, uh, that we had had, myself and my colleagues with this, um, and also put some configuration files on the slides so that if you wanted to do this yourself in the future, you can sort of take this as a, as, as a <coughs> sort of a semi-tutorial. Um, but if you've got questions, just you know, stop me and, and ask me as we go. And I didn't put it up there, but if you want to email me, uh, ian.jarrett at gmail.com. You should find me wherever I happen to be. So I'm going to start, give you a, a sort of a quick overview as to what I've been doing in network management, um, what my credentials are. Then I was going to give an overview of what the problem is that um, we've tried to solve with this and then go through how it's been done. And then right at the end, I've got a load of screenshots that uh, can show you sort of what it looks like. Um, so if we don't get time to get to the screenshots, you know, you won't have missed anything. So my career in OSS um, goes back to when I was uh, an undergraduate um, on computer science at university. I did a, an internship at Sun Microsystems and uh, as they say, I met a guy and so when I graduated, I went to a startup called Micromuse um, and I was um, there for a few years writing code. Uh, Micromuse were in London and um, were smack bang between two wonderful pubs, the, the Hot Pole there on the left <laughs> and the Queen Adelaide there on the right. And it was around about 1993, so Rage Against the Machine uh, album was out and it was playing all the time, that's what I remember. Um, and also Nirvana's Nevermind and we wrote some code that was called Netcore Omnibus. So I, I guess you could say the legacy of that is lava lamps and um, multicoloured event lists. So that, um, that was my sort of introduction to, uh, to OSS. I, I came upon this by the way from Sunnet Manager um, which is what I was looking at when I was at Sun Microsystems. So if you remember uh, earlier on today, somebody mentioned Sun OS 4, so that, that's, that's my kind of generation. So from that, um, I moved to, to a slower pace of life at Ericsson, um, wrote some open source software in 96, which I think back in those days wasn't called open source, it was probably just public domain. But anybody download Beast? No, I don't think so. Did you? There were about two people on the internet at that time that downloaded it. Beast was both Expect and Scotty together. It was a tickle language. Um, good acronym, anyway. Um, and after that, I moved over to um, the Bay Area where I was working in the, uh, the labs with Ericsson, who had invested in a, another dot-com startup, Juniper. Um, and we wrote a network management system, which I think was the first one for Juniper back in 2000. Um, but a lot of the people that we worked with at Juniper at that time had their IPO and became very, very wealthy. So I jumped ship and went to Juniper. Um, very wealthy. Yeah, I wasn't. They were. I know. I've missed them both. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, so I, I was there for nine years um, as a product manager, and a, a lot of the, the SNMP MIBs, especially the early stuff, um, the early XML APIs. Junior script, as it was called at the time. Um, the CLI used to sort of fall under my wing. Um, and there's, there's an old, I think that was the original Juniper M40, but they've got a lot faster these days. So that's kind of my introduction to, to management, network management. Don't ask me, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, 
So currently, like a lot of people probably here today, if you've got kids of a certain age, my main job really is to build and maintain Minecraft servers for children, uh, the kids and, and their friends. So that's, that's what I do most of the time. I was doing it last night, troubleshooting a world that wouldn't start. Um, in my spare time, I work at Arkiva, um, who are not too far from here. Um, and if you've never heard of Arkiva, the, the main thing they do is they provide the television and radio uh, in the UK um, and services around that, a, a lot of satellite stuff. Um, also things like the Coast Guards and the police radio, um, a, lot of, a lot of various different networks, a lot of broadcast, a lot of stuff that I know absolutely nothing about. Um, and also other networks uh, and in this particular case there is a network that is used um, as, a, as a tier one private uh, pro tier one network for utility companies that Archive operate and that's where OpenNMS sits or rather that's where this OpenNMS sits because there are other ones too. So th the problem now is how do we monitor services in a, in a large tier one um, BGP network. So, just a quick show of hands. Anybody used BGP before? Good. So I can skip through all of this. Okay. So the, the problem that we've got essentially is Arkiva there uh, or me on the left hand side um, and I have um, a bunch of customers and we have uh, peering with one another so BGP has this concept of border routers as you probably know uh, border routers create uh, relationships with one another and um, share information about the various autonomous systems that they each are borders to so when a peer um, makes a connection with another peer, it updates an entry in, in the BGP for MIB um, and includes in there uh, details about the state of that link. And I think if I remember rightly, there's five states, six states, sorry, of, of that um, connection. And the, 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 the top state, the sixth one, is established. And if it's established, we're good. If it's not established, there's a problem. So really all we need to do is monitor this MIB, take a look at the BGP state for the various connections and if it's not 6 we should do something about it. Now, in this particular network we've got um, our customers on the right hand side here and we have um, on our side, on the left hand side, we have a main and a reserve uh, router actually at two different sites that are connected to each customer and each customer has a primary and a secondary router connecting back to us. So from their side of the world they always have two options to come over to us and again they're on different sites as well. And what we do is from our main site we connect to the primaries, from our, our re uh, reserve site we connect to the backups and um, if the main fails the backup takes over and what we see is a change in state of the various connections and on the left there, on our side of the network, we have OpenNMS. So, at a very, very simple level, what, I mean, there's, there's always more than one way to, to solve a problem and I guess you could look at this and say, well, okay, you could have done it this way or that way. The way that we chose to do it was to monitor the, the MIB um, on each of the peers and to collect information from the the BGP peer table and in, in this case we're looking at collecting the status value for each of the connections and just applying a threshold to that so as the diagram shows here if that drops from the established state we'll get a, a threshold falling uh, event and if that rises uh, it goes back up we'll get a threshold rearm event so that's kind of how we have open NMS keeping tabs on the uh, various um, connections and as you can see you know once it comes into OpenNMS we can do stuff like graph it um, 
and as you'll see in a minute, other stuff as well. So, this, this particular um, installation we have, or I'm talking about, has been in place for several years. Um, like a lot of um, service providers, Arkiva have the opinion that if it's not broken, don't fix it, don't, don't, don't touch it, just leave it as it is. So we're running 1.8 and it works just well, it's it just, just fine, you know, we, we don't have any issues with it, so we're not going to upgrade it, we're not going to change it, um, at least not for the foreseeable future, unless there's a significant reason to do so. Um, it's not on the public internet, um, so everything I'm going to talk about is from version 1.8 and I dare say it's probably still in the product today in, in some guise or other. Um, but, um, you know, uh, this is kind of a two-year-old <coughs> presentation, if you like. So, th this sort of diagram shows the various components within OpenNMS that we're using. So, starting on the left-hand side, we've got the, the router that we are collecting the SNMP data from. So, we've got the data collection going, and that is going up into uh, JRobin files, where operators can look at graphs and that kind of thing. Um, then we've got the thresholding that um, takes a look at the value that's been collected and that may or may not generate an event. Um, if it does, that's getting passed through to the event translator and what we are doing is we're pulling in service information from an external source to uh, enrich the, the translated event that's now in the system. That's then getting passed through to the passive status keeper, which um, we use to maintain the status of all the various connections that are in the, in the network. And if that's a threshold down event that says the service has gone down, then our passive status goes down and we get an outage record. So we have outages being maintained. And then right at the far end, we have the events that are being recorded. Plus we also have them being presented as alarms to, to the operator. So what I was going to do really is kind of explain how each of these pieces has been configured in our system uh, and how they all sort of tie together. So um, before I go any further, how many of you guys have used the passive status keeper? Some of you, you've still got your hair. I tore a lot of mine out actually because <laughs> it was so complicated. <laughs> It was hard. So I've actually tried to explain some of this because I don't want anyone else to go through the same sort of pain. <laughs> so solving the problem, we're going to sort of break it down into chunks. <coughs> First part is the easy part, the data collection and graphing, etc., which is kind of bread and butter for OpenNMS. So the great thing about 1.8 was most of what we needed for this bit was already there. Um, all we had to do was to add a few little pieces to get it working. So the first bit here was adding the BGP PS state to the, um, the collection that was already there for the BGP MIB. So that's the bit that's highlighted in orange. Put that in and that's good. We also um, got tripped up on this one. <coughs> Some of the interfaces we wanted to collect from were not the primary interfaces and it took a while to realise, well, what's going on? You know, there's, there's no data being collected. Until, I think, reading one of the wiki pages somewhere, it suddenly dawned on us, ah, OK, right, we need to change this um, SNMP storage flag. So um, once we did that, collection works OK. Um, although also found the J. Robin Inspector to be a really handy tool to see what's going on with these um, JRB files that, is, that are appearing in the file system. Um, and that, again, that was something that wasn't immediately obvious to us, but once we realised that J. Robin Inspector was there, um, it became quite uh, a handy tool. So if we got the data that's being collected, um, the first thing we wanted to do was to see if we could graph this information. Not particularly useful, you might say. Okay, you know, you've got a, a number. Why do you want to? Why do you want to see it as a graph? Um, one of the benefits of doing this, apart from the fact we've already got the data, so we may as well do something with it, um, is that from an operator's point of view, if, if there are faults in the network, 
they can go back and look at the graph sort of retrospectively and see what was the status of this connection um, historically. You know, was it down last night? Has it, has it only just gone down, etc.? So um, it's actually quite a handy little tool to be able to graph the state for each connection. So um, this is what we set up. Um, this little snippet here is the bit that's come from the SNMP graph properties file, which and I know some people find that file quite um, difficult to, to edit, but um, personally didn't have any problems with it. I found, found it quite intuitive. Okay, um, the next thing then, once we've got this data coming into the system uh, and going off to graphs, is to set thresholds on it. So um, there was already a threshold group in the product for uh, Cisco, so all we have to do is go in and add one for the BGP peer state. Um, so we have a, a falling threshold um, and a rising threshold, falling on six and rising on five, if I remember correctly. Um, and this is all done via the, the UE, the, the user interface. So there's, there's no need to dive into XML, but we did realize that once you've changed the user interface, it actually writes the XML for you. So this is the snippet from the XML um, and it's handy to just uh, keep a copy of this in case somebody screws it up from the user interface and put it back again quite easily. So, again, not particularly complicated to do. Um, uh, and the next thing was um, to set the, um, the, the, when we configured, I'll just go back here, the group name uh, Cisco because that's already configured in the product. So in the data collection part, um, sorry, in the, the, the Thresh D configuration, there's already <coughs> an entry in there for Cisco. So um, we didn't have to change that either. So kind of uh, that was already done, which was fantastic. So we have our threshold rising and falling um, events coming in. We didn't notice one typo in the in the event configuration file, which is it was, it was missing a percent symbol off the end of the parameters. So just had to add that in, and then all of the parameters for the, um, the threshold appeared in the event. Nice and simple. You know, at this point, it's not particularly usable, but it, it's starting to be usable. Um, lastly, on this, on this piece anyway, with the, the thresholding, sometimes we found it a little bit um, confusing as to thresholds we thought should have fired that weren't firing. And I think ultimately that's because OpenNMS was maintaining a state for these thresholds. And once a, a value had fallen below, it wasn't going to send another falling one. Um, once we sort of figured that one out, it became fairly obvious. But turning on debugging, you, you get some very helpful debug like you see here that shows exactly what's happening with ThreshD. So, Again, that was just one little thing that I, I, I think we, we found very, very valuable is, is just enabling debugging. So the next part, what, kind of at this point in time, what we have got set up is the data collection, uh, the graphing, and the thresholding. Um, so the next part now is can we add customer data? So <coughs> can, can we add some service information about which customer or which BGP service is, uh, is at fault now. So the first thing we want to do is um, store additional information such as the name of the service or the customer name, um, the type of the link, uh, the circuit number, uh, contact details um, and correlate that when we get the, th the threshold failing um, and pull that information in. And the easiest thing to do is to use the Postgres database that OpenNMS is using itself and just to create uh, an extra table there and store the information that we wanted to store. So a um, simple shell script like this is, is good enough to create the table um, and this is just a, a snippet. I think ultimately we've probably got about 12 different fields in the table where we're storing different bits of information but um, you get the idea um, sort of the IP addresses of both ends of the connection 
um, plus some customer information, customer name, contact details, that, that sort of thing. Um, so use this script to create the table and then like probably every organisation in the world um, there are spreadsheets that keep um, customer details in lists and spreadsheets in lists so go and find the person that's got the spreadsheet for all the BGP customers um, and suck it into uh, Postgres so you know as I said here this is uh, this came in via Excel converted to a CSV file and pulled into uh, Postgres so you just got to love this modern technology so a, a little shell script like this kind of loops through a, a CSV file and, and creates the entries in Postgres for each customer and it's, you know, it's not rocket science um, there may be better ways of doing it but it, it works <coughs> for us ok so we've got this kind of separate table in Postgres with all our customer information um, so the next thing we needed to do was create services in OpenNMS and then um, provision these services on various interfaces on the devices so the, ne the next thing to do really was to create the services and as we found the easiest way to do that is to insert them directly into the OpenNMS database in Postgres so uh, again I think this is where the wiki came in really helpful so you know here's the example creating three services in OpenNMS for customer A, customer B, customer C again shell script nice and simple you know don't make it too complicated and then we're going to be using um, the polar to monitor these services so um, for each one of these services that we create we, we create a, a, a sort of a corresponding configuration that goes into the, the polar um, and we are using the passive service keeper to, to keep a check on this and because it, it's, um, it's not going out and polling a device we can do this pretty frequently so that's our polar configuration there and then I've had to scrub some of these names out because people at work get paranoid if we say which customers we've got um, so this is the, the provisioning side and, and again this is all done via the, the, the web UI um, so going into the provisioning group click on the, the device that you um, want to provision the service on go down to the interface and then add the services that we had just created in Postgres um, and so what we have in the network is you imagine a, a router that's got multiple interfaces um, some interfaces have got more than one um, customer service going across them so as you can see in the example here you, you might have more than one service on an individual interface so go through the web UI sort of add them in the various provisioning groups nice and simple and then come back out and then just click on that synchronize button and it, it creates them for us so we're getting closer we've got the data coming in we've got the thresholding we've got the graphing we've got the events we've now got the services in there that we provisioned onto the interfaces the, the last thing really is to have this um, event translator that looks for these threshold events and maps those to the, the actual passive service and creates the up and the down so that's this bit now which is what I've just said so we, we now have the event translator which um, was pro with, with this and the passive status keeper were the, the, the two hardest things I think to get working um, so a bit of hair pulling but we got there in the end yeah you, do you know what actually when, when I was putting these slides together I was looking back at the XML thinking yeah actually that's, that's obvious yeah, that's really uh, you know I don't know, what, I don't know what the problem was first time around um, anyway so what I've tried to do is kind of put some snippets here as to <coughs> what, what's in the config to, to make it easier um, if you want to give it a go so uh, this example is just is the, the, the service down event what happens when we get the, the service down so uh, at top uh, in the orange there you can see we are looking for the, the BGP peer state threshold falling event from way back at the beginning um, so when that event comes in we 
create a, this, this translation one, so we create a new uh, translation. This one is going to be for our passive service status. So each of these little um, sections in the XML creates different fields in the event. So one little glitch there, we found that the description wasn't set unless we set it in here. So we sort of hard code a description. This is version 1.8, so I don't know if that's been fixed. So, one of the great things about the translator is it can go out to an external source to pull in information. So, if you remember, we created that table in Postgres where we put the customer service data. So, what we're doing now in these sections is we are going out to Postgres with this uh, select statement here and we're, we're pulling in um, the values that are the result of that SQL query. Um, so here we're, we're going out to the customer table um, and we're where the, uh, the uh, parameter where the remote address matches the IP that's come in from the threshold and we're looking for the state and putting that into a parameter called path state. And then because the passive status keeper needs um, kind of four extra fields in order for it to work, so we have these four separate um, sections now. So we've got one here that goes out to collect, or to go and find the, the, the label of the, the node. So again, that's a, a SQL query that goes off to Postgres um, based on the, uh, the, uh, the label, and it pulls that in. We've got another one that goes to find the service name, so we're selecting the, the BGP remote service name from our table and pulling that in. We've got another one that looks for the passive IP address um, and pulls that. And then the last one that sets a, a constant, uh, because this is a falling service, it, it sets the passive status to down. And then you would repeat that whole thing for the the rising or the up uh, event. So the last part then is the event configuration. So, so we have this passive status keeper that's raising these up or down events. Um, one of the problems that we found, uh, if you call it a problem, is that in, in 1.8 there was only um, one event for the passive status keeper, which is the passive, state, passive service status event. Um, on the positive side, that made event configuration really easy. Um, on the negative side, perhaps a little restrictive. Anyway, so here you can see um, we're putting in our own log message, etc., um, along with some various uh, parameters. And then to test it, to make sure that it works, using the, the Perl script send event.pl. Um, so providing it with some parameters such as which interface um, and which values. So using this it's very easy to sort of kind of kind of debug it really, but certainly to test it you can fire off events and see what happens. Does the translator work as you expected? Um, does it pull the right information back from Postgres as you expected? Uh, and at the same time for troubleshooting this you can uh, enable debugging for the event translator and also for the passive status keeper and certainly in our case that helped uh, tremendously we were able to see exactly what was going on okay so to prove that it works if you like we've got some uh, screenshots of what um, what the guys uh, who are using this see so when we get our um, connection down, when, the, when the, the connection to a peer fails, we get an, a number of things actually that, that come through to the operators. So um, at the top we get a, a service outage um, that's kind of um, fairly generic because it's um, supposed to be simple so they understand exactly what's going on, best to say, but um, we get information there that says the IP address, we include the, the name of the service, so you actually blacked it out so you can't see, but that's come in from Postgres. Um, we also get a passive status event that tells us a little bit more, so in, in this example here we've got the VRF details that 
get put into the, the message. Um, and then at the bottom we get our threshold um, breached as well. So perhaps overkill that we get three events instead of one, but they, it certainly makes them pay attention that um, something has gone wrong. So they should uh, pick up the phone or log a ticket. So they can click on one of these and go and get more details. So the, dis um, the instructions and the log message again is kind of packed out with a little bit more um, information that's come from Postgres so you can, I guess you can be as cre creative as you like. Okay, same thing with the, with the service down alarm. Um, blacked out for security reasons. So on the, the, uh, the node page we can see, if you remember with the um, provisioning groups we were assigning services to each interface. So when you're looking at the node page, uh, like on the left here, you can see the, the interfaces in the node and then you can see for each interface all the various services that OpenNMS is monitoring. So the, you know, the, the usual ones like um, ICMP and SNMP are there. but when you start provisioning these services, you start to see the service names in the interfaces appear in the node page too. So that's really useful for the operators. They can see exactly which customer services are going over those interfaces and um, what their availability has been like. We also have, because we've got the passive status keeper, we have outages that go through to the outages <coughs> page as well. Um, and what I don't show here is kind of separately to this, we run um, SQL queries on the outages table to produce like a sum total of downtime per month per customer, um, which is very useful. But here you can see we've got um, the, the outages on the node page, um, and then also on the bottom there we've got the outages page that shows us when the services have gone down as well. So it's all, it's exactly what the operators want to see actually, it's, it's very, very useful. Um, threshold up and down events, I think these are probably superfluous and not really that necessary but again they, they want to see them. So we just um, get information that comes through that tells us which service has gone up and down. And then the alarm page in a bit more detail. Um, the log message has been expanded with some fields that have come from Postgres so that's very helpful. And then lastly here, um, at the top there, you see the outage page that shows the BGP services come back up. So we get a regained time of when it came back up. Um, but as, as it says up there, um, even though the service has come back, if you're looking on the node page, <coughs> depending upon how long that service has been down for, the colour may still be red for some time because it's based on a percentage value. Um, so it just helps our operators to keep an eye on particular uh, connections. And probably like a lot of you, our guys are using this 24 hours a day, <coughs> seven days a week. So you have to always bear in mind that there's going to be somebody sitting in front of this at three o'clock on a Sunday morning. So they, they just need to be aware that, or we need to be aware when we sort of design these things and, and install them, that um, the information that we provide to the operator is succinct but also um, brightly coloured enough. In fact what, what I can't show you here is that a lot of these alarms actually flash and audible alarms are, are going off as well in the background so um, it hopefully wakes the guys up on a Sunday morning when they've had a little snooze. Alright, um, last, last one from me really, just some of the limitations of what we found in 1.8. So. Honestly, I can't comment on whether these have been fixed because we are still on 1.8. Um, but the passive statuses was an interesting one. It's either up or down. But what happens if it's unknown? So that, that was something that was um, as a shame. We thought, oh, it's disappointing. You can't have an unknown state. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, there's only one type of passive status event. Um, which, which made the event configuration easy, but more different um, events would have been good. 
the wiki documentation was good in, in places. I think the, the wiki page for the passive status keeper, whoever wrote that, um, that was fantastic. Very, very, very good page. Um, I wish all of the wiki was at, at that standard because that was, um, that was a good page. Um, configuring SQL in XML is a pain in the ass. I have to say, looking at it on these slides, it looks fairly obvious, but when you're looking at it on a, um, a terminal, it is not so good. Um, and lastly, one of the one one of the, the, the sort of the, the annoying things that the operators really had wanted was a graphical map showing BGP connections. But we knew it didn't do that anyway, so um, it's just a little but a uh, little sort of um, way of saying, well, would be nice if we could have had that in 1.8. But there you go. Okay. Um, that's it. Actually, I spoke pretty quick, so it's uh, only five past. But any any questions? How did you manage um, changes? Because if it's not static, is it? So if you don't need customers, you don't need services. Did you have to handle it? Okay, you have to handle it. The, the, the Postgres table phrase. Yeah, so actually. Sorry, yeah, so the, the, right, the question is how do we manage changes? The, the only thing that really changes now is the, we may add or remove customers from the system. So in that situation, all we need to do is, from the provisioning groups, make sure the services are on the correct interfaces. And then from the, the Postgres side, make sure we've got the correct customer details in the SQL table. And there's a fairly, um, a fairly rigorous change control process <coughs> actually in the company which means you, you can't just go in and add them, you have to sort of book it in advance um, but it's, it's not impossible. In terms of the rest of it, for actually changing the, the configuration files, if that's what, what you're referring to, um, when we develop it on the development systems we use subversion so all of the configs are in subversion and, and we, we can tag them to a particular release so we can build a release and install that which is just a bunch of config files. Any other questions? Okay. Good question. Yeah, it's yes is the answer. <coughs> Maybe that's a topic for another another conference. Um, yeah, o Open NMS is actually monitoring a number of different networks in the company. This is just one example of one of the things that it's doing. But, um, what about SPF? So you try to monitor SPF in your or not? No, we haven't. No, the only reason I, I, I picked on this one is because I think it, it may be of value to, to to you guys, but also, also the question is why you have decided to, you can use the thread. You say that the only motivation to not use the thread to the thread is no, to establish a better for the uh, two tracks and then give the same information. Yeah, actually, I, I didn't, I didn't show that piece of the conflict, but we do receive the traps as well. Um, it, it's a political thing, actually. At the end of the day, there were um, some people in the company that said traps are not reliable. You can't guarantee on receiving a trap. Um, so that kind of led us down the path of saying, okay, if you don't want to rely upon traps, then we can poll it from the device instead. So. That's kind of why we went down this path 
Um, but like you say, either one would have worked, um, and we get traps as well. So, um, yeah, point taken. So along those lines, what's the fragrance of your bullet? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it is. I'm just trying to remember. It's, um, it's we got the same. Okay, so the same open NMS system is is talking to some boxes on uh, 3G connections once an hour and to the BGP stuff I think it's every five minutes. Five minutes. And just given your background previously, what, what are your sort of general impressions of NMS as a platform which you've used it in our keyboard? Oh, um, yeah, really good. I'd, I'd say probably the best toolkit that there is the best tool in the box, put it that way. It's um, it, it's like um, it's like your Swiss Army knife. You know, it, it can do pretty much anything you want. Um, if, if you know, if you've got a bit of imagination, and I, I've seen a lot of network management products over the years, um, and I don't think I've seen one. Certainly, I haven't seen one that can scale as well as OpenNMS can in terms of data collection, ability to poll data and to receive. Uh, I was talking to uh, one of the guys outside earlier on about syslog, um, where we had incorrectly configured some firewalls that spewed um, several million messages to us in a couple of hours over syslog, and the thing didn't fall over at all. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think it's the best, the best um, tool in the box. It's, it's the best one that I've seen. That's, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Do you collect also a number of statistics from BGP peers, as a number of prefixes received and so on? And do you have to add on these numbers? We don't. <coughs> no, we don't actually, because that's not really the service that we're providing. Um, we, we're really only concerned about the um, whether the connections are up or down. That's, that's, all, we're, that's all we're paid for. So that's really your client side, but other your peers? Yeah. You know, yeah. Is it the same? Up to, up to the, whoever you're peering upstream to? Do you mean do they do the same kind of monitoring? No, no, I'm wondering, I'm wondering you know, because I think the question is that they'd be more relevant right, for, for your upstream or your downstream peers. Yeah, actually, well, the interesting thing is that they're not, um, they're not ISPs, so that there's not a huge number of prefixes that they're. Uh, yeah, you know, flip the question around. So the ISP that you're connecting to, I mean, the, they're even concerned about you know, it. Is something changed from their perspective only like years like Yeah. Um, although it's although it's using BGP, they're not they're not service providers in that context. They they are kind of enterprises that use BGP um, to to to, sh to share their routes, and um, so we are. We're not that concerned about the number of prefixes that, that they are providing to us. Um, so all, all we really look at is the state of the link. Okay. All right. So I'm sort of 15 minutes uh, ahead, Craig. But Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.